Hello, everybody. This is the UK Crime Book Club. Um, cozy first. How cozy are we? We'll soon find out. But this one is a very special one. This is going to be all about Agatha Christie. And I've even managed to get her up on the wall. So she's looking down on us all at the moment. So we better not make any errors here. So I'm joined by the lovely Sophia and Katie, whose books I absolutely adore. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their books um, because they know about them most, I think. <laughs> so, Sophia, take it away. OK, thank you very much. Um, I am SJ Bennett uh, for the purposes of writing, which is my real name. Um, and I write uh, this, this series. This is the latest book, Murder Most Royal, um, about the Queen as a detective. Um, and the three books that are out so far are set in 2016. And the Queen is 90. Um, and turns out she's been solving crimes since she was a teenager. Um, things that sort of just happen around her. Um, a, a strange number of murders do. Um, and she's really good at um, solving them. And the first book in the series is this one here, which is called The Winds Are Not. Lovely. I've, I've, I've loved them. I absolutely love them. They're a fantastic series. And Katie, I've just recently read yours, so oh. take it away. <laughs> Um, I'm Katie Watson. I'm the author of The Three Dahlias, which looks like this, um, which is my debut crime novel. It came out last summer and it's about three actresses from different generations who were all famous for playing the same fictional detective and who, when brought together at a fan convention for the author of the detective novels, uh, are drawn together as they have to try and solve a murder. Both fantastic, strong ideas as well. Just, just brilliant. And I was having a look on both of your websites, which I must say, anybody who's listening now must go to both these ladies' websites because they are absolutely fantastic. Um, um, both of you say that you grew up reading murder mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, which was your first and was it Agatha Christie? If I go to Sophia first, I'm only <laughs> doing it with what I can see on the screen who's coming up first. <laughs> The first ones I remember reading when I was about seven or eight were the Ellery Queen stories from the Ellery Queen magazine because my mother had a book of it lying around our house and I was I got bored a lot and um, I was very good at kind of just combing the bookshelves for something and they were a lovely length and they were always really atmospheric and creepy. So I started with Ellery Queen um, and then the ones I remember reading early on were the Dorothy Sayers story. So I kind of started with Dorothy Sayers properly um, and I read all the um, the kind of classic crime novelists. Uh, but she was and remains my favourite. Um, and I discovered Agatha a little bit later on, I think. Oh, really? And your favourite Dorothy L. Sayers would be? Oh, it, it varies. Sometimes it's the Nine Tailors, but sometimes it's Whose Body, which is the first one. Um, and she's still kind of feeling her way in. And it has anti-Semitic overtones that I don't like. But apart from that, I love Lord Peter Whimsey's mother in it, the Duchess. She's she's very, very funny and actually very, very useful. Um, and when I'm trying to think about how to plot and things, I often think about that. And there's a short story called In the Teeth of the Evidence, um, which has a really creepy, creepy ending that um, I particularly love as well. Oh, I'm going to have to look for that. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, Strong Poison was always my favourite. Yeah. I love that one. <laughs> yes. Katie, Katie, how about you? Uh, what was, Can you remember your first? I have a really poor memory. So I actually had to go uh, and speak to my family about this a little bit. We have a family chat every week with my parents and my brothers. We're on video call and I was trying, trying to ask them. It's like, because I just remember watching Murder, She Wrote, you know, and oh. I know I must. Have <laughs> I remember Friday oh. nights, hot dogs, Murder, She Wrote. That was a thing when I was about eight. Um, but I know I read a lot of Agatha Christie's over, like, um, summer holidays in Wales in the rain, um, you know, wherever we're staying in a caravan or wherever, there's, there's always an Agatha Christie. So I know I read and went away through a lot of them. Um, and I also love the Dorothy L. Sayers. I used to listen to them on audiobook from the library. Um, I remember listening to a lot of them that way. But the ones I remember reading that I still reread now and stuck with me are the MMK uh, Death In series. Uh, she, she did sort of six murder mysteries, death in Zanzibar, death in Cyprus, death in Berlin. And I, I devoured those um, and they are remain some of my favourites. Fantastic. Now, but... <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So 
which is your first Agatha? Can you remember what your first Agatha Christie was? Well, I did ask, I asked my mum and dad, and my mum said, oh, I think you were about 12 or 13, and it was a murder in the vicarage. I said, no, mum, that, that was you. And she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> no. And my dad said, oh, I think she's about that age, but it was, um, why didn't they ask Evans? I'm like, no, dad, that's your favourite. <laughs> so nobody could remember. I think it might have been the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Oh, really? Well, that's a good one to get in, isn't it, as your first one. How about you, Sophia? Can you remember your first Agatha? Not with any certainty, but I think it might have been that one as well. Mm. Um, but I get the books and the films mixed up in terms of which order I, I saw yeah. and, and read things in. I was a massive Peter Ustinov as Poirot fan. Um, I think the first one I, I remember reading as a book properly, though, was The Body in the Library. And that mm. I still really love. Yes. Yeah. I think my favourite, well, my first one was, I was way too young, but we didn't have so many kids books in our house when I was little. It was just, you know, dusty old bookcases on landings and stuff. And I think every house must have had an Agatha Christie somewhere in it. And mine was yeah. Murder on the Orient Express. And I just thought, you know, a rainy day in Sheffield and, and getting on board this train where, you know, there were a Russian princess, a strange detective to film stars it was just unbelievable and going to the library afterwards with my little copy and saying do you have any more books by this lady <laughs> <laughs> this huge shelf yeah. okay yes it would appear um but what was it about agatha's writing that first attracted you and i'll start with katie this time <laughs> mixing it up <laughs> I suspect it, um, I think it was to a degree just the world that you suddenly inhabit when you read one of her mysteries. You are suddenly mm. in a different time and place, but it's a world that you understand and that makes sense, even though I live you know, many, many years away from it. I understood it. I, I could inhabit it and I could be there and I could follow. It. And I think, you know, obviously it's the clever plots, it's the characters, it's how she brings it all together, it's the sense of everything being right at the end, but more than anything, she just created a world I felt I knew. Yeah, completely, you know, you're stepping on board the Orient Express as an eight-year-old child. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a place I would never go to in real life and never imagine these people I could never meet, but I believed in all of them. Yeah, completely, and how about you, Sophia? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it, the setting, definitely. And, and I think she was quite calculating sometimes about mm. thinking, oh, readers will love it if I if I set a book this year in a lovely Devon seaside resort, that will cheer them all up after the war or whatever it is. <laughs> um, so go her, because it definitely worked. Um, and actually, I stayed in Devon a couple of years ago, not that far from where Evil Under the Sun was originally mm. set. Um, and it was lovely. I mean, it just it feels like such Agatha country it down is. there. It is. Um, so I love that. And I, I also I, she she could sort of test herself out with psychology. I think she was always trying to sort of mm. push the limits, understand um, um, developments in psychology and, and then get that in the book. And I don't she didn't always do it um, quite as a scientist would have done, but it was still really interesting to see that in there. So I liked that. And, I, and I, there are some lovely, particularly Marple moments. There's one in the body in the library where she suddenly turns to um, to this, you know, um, very sort of rakish woman and says, you're going to have to admit that you're married. And she's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I love moments like that. Yeah, they're really satisfying. I try and get them in my books, too. We've got a couple of questions in the chat that are fantastic. Um, in light of her fascination with poisons, do you have a favourite poison to use in your own work, Katie? Ooh. I think uh, poisons are a lot harder to use these days because mm. obviously it was so easy back then just to get your hands on some rat poison. Not a problem. It's a bit bit trickier now. Yeah. Um, so I like the more natural poison, poisonous plants and, and flowers and things are my my favourites. Yeah. I you do poison much. beautifully in your in your book. I think it's amazing. I love it. Absolutely love it. And I agree with you, it's hard because it's all been done before. So finding a, a new way of approaching it is, is tricky. But no, I thought you did it so well. Oh thank you. That took lots <laughs> of time and thinking. <laughs> Most time <laughs> most of my book was spent figuring that bit out. So I'm so fantastic. It's a difficult one though, isn't it? Because you have to get the science right. I did mushrooms, which was fairly easy. Um, and also yes. they were called Destroying Angel and I had people called Angel in the book. So I thought that was quite, quite good and quite useful. Uh, my but still, you, the, my, my search history 
it doesn't look pretty on my husband. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's a chemist, so I just say, could I kill people this way? <laughs> goes, oh, that's oh. useful. <laughs> That's useful. How about you, Sophia? Does the queen have anyone been poisoned? I haven't poisoned anybody yet. Um, my my favourite one was, I think, in book two, where where somebody seems to have an accident where she tripped on some broken glass. Um, but it wasn't obviously quite that simple. But it was based on a true-to-life thing that happened in Scotland where a man dropped a whiskey bottle, I think it was a whiskey bottle, and, and a really big shard of glass caught him in the ankle and he very nearly died because cool. it caught him in exactly the wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, so when people say, oh, that could never happen, I'm thinking, you know, really, really could. Um, so that's <laughs> been my favourite, but no, no poison yet. And there isn't poison in the one I'm writing at the moment. So, yeah, I can... There will, I think there will have to be in book five, though. So, yes, I, I'll build myself up to that. The, your, your chemist husband could come in very handy. Yes. So. Lots of questions about poisons. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a very good question. Now, I'm going to come on to, do you reread any of her books? Because obviously, such as, for instance, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd is possibly one of the greatest denouements in, in crime history, mm -hmm. um, fictionally. Um, once you know the ending, are you happy to go back and reread those books? I certainly go back and 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 see how she did it, mm -hmm. not just the who done it part. Yeah. And when you see those tiny little droplets that have been seeded through the book, it's yeah. even greater. Um, how about you, Sophia? Do you do you go back? Do you reread? I do go back. I do reread. I, I plunder for ideas. So I'm, I very much do it as a writer in terms of which point of view is she using? How is she she, she sort of steeding those those chapters and those clues? How how many pages can I get through before um, I, I see something that is relevant to the denouement? And it's it's very rare, actually. There's usually something on almost every single page that, that's mm -hmm. relevant, even though yeah. it's obviously carefully hidden. Um, I love that. Um, I, I read a whole bunch of Poirot short stories before I wrote The Winds Are Not. I mean, I think we're 800 pages worth of short stories yeah. um, to see how she did it. And I found it hugely inspirational because she did it every, every way you could think of. There was first person narrative and third person narrative. And sometimes the murderer was the narrator and sometimes the detective was and sometimes the victim was. And she really just kind of, you know, as soon as somebody told her that, that you can't do it that way, she did it that way. Yeah. Um, so I, that's kind of where I reread now. And I actually enjoy them far more knowing the ending and doing a reread. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think I would find Murder on the Orient Express quite boring for the first half if I didn't know what happened. Because she, she builds it up quite slowly, kind of presenting yeah. characters before something happens. And if you know why, then then it's absolutely great. Again, not a page wasted. But um, if I didn't know that, I'd be thinking, oh, for goodness sake, I don't need to know about this, Countess. You know, get on with it. I don't know, though. I quite like the setting building. That is quite fun. And uh, yeah, but I do go back and I reread them quite a lot because I forget things as well. Mm. So especially with the short stories, there <laughs> are so many of them. Mm. But there are a couple of really obscure ones that you go back to. And recently I went back to the Bloodstained Pavement. Absolutely fabulous. It's just so tight, the writing. And it flips around and you think, oh my goodness, of course it was that. But I could never see that. I don't know. I still don't know how she constructed that. <laughs> how about you, Kate? Did you go back? Do you reread? I do very much. Um... I think, especially with Agatha Christie's, it's so long since I've read some of them. And I know I have at some point read, maybe not all the short stories, but all the novels. And I've seen probably all of the TV adaptations as well. So I must know the endings, but I don't always remember them. Often I do. And it's quite interesting to see at what point that kicks in. Yeah. Um, but yeah. like Sophia, the ones that I do know backwards, like The Body in the Library, things like that, I love reading and seeing how she builds that up and, and where the clues come in. And yeah, it it's very much counts as research now, which is uh, great because I can claim I'm working when I'm still yeah. <laughs> <Same thing. laughs> My family are always going past the study and they can hear. Nah, 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 da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching it again. Have you not watched them all? Yes, a little bit more. Every Christmas day when I'm cooking the turkey, I, I watch every Christmas day, I watch all three of the, the Murder on the Orient Express, the oh, Houston God. off one, really? the Suchet one, and then by the end, I'm okay to watch the Branagh one because, you know, okay. <laughs> I can't bring myself <laughs> to, that moustache, no. <laughs> not happening. 
<laughs> it grows on you. It grows it, on you. It's grown on him. <laughs> <laughs> with rulers, apparently they held it up with strings and all sorts. Yeah. But if you do, if you go through the sort of old short stories, his moustache gets more extravagant as he gets more wealthy and well known as a private detective mm. because he can afford to keep it and look after it. So. Maybe Mr. Browner has a point. Who knows? Who knows? Now, this kind of feeds into my next question about time and as going back to the stories as um, older people than children, basically. But does your opinion and your feeling about the books and the characters change with time? So, for instance, now I'm older, reading Death on the Nile again or watching recent productions, etc., my perception is very different to when I was a child or, you know, a young adult. Mm. It wasn't just the, wow, what an amazing story, which, of course, it is. Um, with, but without giving too much away to anybody who doesn't know the, the ending to Death on the Nile, they are deeply in love with each other, two of the people. But one of them is watching the person she loves sleep with another person. Um, and, and I find that deeply uh, distressing a lot of the time because, you know, she, they have a whirlwind romance, they get married. But actually, you know, the physicality of them being two married people, she's there and watching this unfold simply for money, basically. So as, as I've grown older, my perception has changed. And it's quite a dark book if you look at it in that way. So when you reread do you find that your perception has changed with time and you're not just looking for the who done it aspect would you say sophia i mean often i think not actually they sort of are preserved in aspect for me but but if it does change then it is it is appreciating the darkness more i think and to go back to the body in the library as as i so regularly do the actual underlying murder in that is absolutely horrible yes horrible cozy crime yeah. you know it's not cozy it's, not cozy <laughs> it's really not it's just and horrific I, and yeah and even though, even though i was a brownie and i should have taken it personally mm -hmm. i i just thought i was fine with it when i was younger i'm i'm much less fine with it now um so yes i guess that kind of level of perception has come through and also um oh the, the cat the cat with the um with the pussy paw Again, if you if you really think about the way that the, that murder was um, was done, it's very very horrible. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of more tuned into that. I guess what a dark yeah. imagination she had. Yeah. And how about you, Katie? I think I agree with both those. I think um, when I read them now, I definitely see things in them I never registered as a child, and it's always to do with humanity, the the, the people yeah. in them, the characters. Mm -hmm. I see so much more in them, and I think probably having seen more of the world and more of people, I am both more and less surprised by the depths and, and the horror and the, <laughs> the things in it. And I think I, it just, it hits differently now. Yes. And it's quite, I find that I'm, I'm probably a bit more, I don't know, a little bit more emotional about things. Yeah. So things like the 450 from Paddington and the old ladies, you know, she's just going off to London. She thinks she knows something bad is happening. And somebody shoves her under a car and you're like, oh, God, no. This is just, yeah, they're a lot, I find them a lot more affecting. Maybe I was just a little bit more bulletproof when I was younger and, and just wanted to know who done it. Um, yeah. I think there is an element. I mean, I, I watch programmes now with my 14-year-old daughter and we'll be watching them and I'll be going, I can't watch this bit. I can't. No, I can't. And yeah. she'll like, I'll tell you when it's over, Mum. And she has no problem with a lot yeah. of things that I look at and can't watch, whereas maybe when she's my age, she will. <laughs> Exactly. I think that's exactly. true. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't watch things like Bambi when I was growing up. I was kind of sensitive that way. But anything detective-y, I was just just mm. for the, there for the puzzle. So that was fine. And yeah, it's uh, it's changed a bit now. But mm. um, but yeah, but still love them. Yeah, no, the darker the better, really. Yeah. And does that affect your writing? Does Agatha's writing? Because I think you were saying, Sophia, you go back more with a writer's eye yeah. over, the, over the books. And sort of say, oh gosh, yes, that is such a fantastic way to to hide a plot point. So obviously yeah. you'll use, I don't know, humour, or it's just a tiny little point that slips away, and you've been told, but it's hidden in a certain way. Does that affect your writing in any way, Agatha's methods? I think 
I think it does. Having a lot of dialogue in there. I mean, again, if you just kind of skim through the books, you just see it's page after page. There's people talking to each other rather than lots and lots of interior monologue and that kind of thing. So um, and I think that's why they feel so pacey. So um, I, I definitely feel influenced by that. And I, I actually in the book I'm writing now, um, it's partly set. Um, readers who know Agatha well will kind of recognise this in the Muse house that she had uh, in the late 20s uh, in oh. Chelsea. Um, oh, yeah. Say that specifically, but people will recognise it from Murder in the Muse. Um, so I've got all these little Agatha Easter eggs coming in, which I really, oh, I love that. really enjoy. Um, and there was a wonderful description in, in one of my books about her um, that, that she she said one of her stories, oh, the one with the um, the girl scout who is killed is definitely not one of her greatest novels at all. And it's Ariadne um, who is investigating. Um, and But she was describing how she was in her own garden when she sort of suddenly thought, oh, uh, you know, it's quite a long way to the boathouse and uh, what would happen. And she was having a really, really lovely day. But all these ideas were just coming together of how to commit a murder there and get away with it. Um, and I love that. And I do often think of that because, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of it. I think that the elements of plotting come to me in a similar way, although I'm not nearly as efficient as she was at pulling it all together, I don't think. I think that one's Greenshaw's Folly, but that's the one that yes. basically she wrote about a million times in all different manners and has oh, really? all different people. Sure. It's a short story that was supposed to be to help out a church with their window, and then it became a book, and it's, it's wonderful. And I love, you can go on the, I think you can go on the Agatha. Christie Trail at, at Greenway and, and you can go to the boathouse mm -hmm. and you know they have a little treasure hunt there sometimes but hopefully no one gets um you know <laughs> too much trouble. <laughs> How about you Katie? Do you find that you're 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 influenced by her writing methods and absolutely and I think rereading her gives me permission to try things as well. When mm. I look at all the different ways she wrote and all the different things she tried and, and again how dark her stories could be sometimes it makes me feel a little freer um I agree yeah when I first started uh plotting out the three dahlias and started thinking about it I'd never written a murder mystery before I'd read a lot but I'd never never written one and I picked up uh, this book which I'm sure you've, you've probably both read uh, of her secret notebook yes yes and, and going through and seeing all her notes and the notes she made and obviously you know a lot of them are meaningless if you don't already know the stories which you know I, I did but there's nothing in there I could copy, but just knowing that, yes, yeah, she wrote ridiculous notes that didn't make any sense as well. Yeah. Great, <laughs> I can do that. She fills pages and pages with, oh, but maybe this, but how about this? Lovely, I can do that too. Um, it made it feel more possible. Yeah, that's a book that I have in the boot of my car for in case I break down. Really? <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> such a good idea. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I thought I would read them for how it is done. But actually, mm. what you get out of it is you can do it any way you like. And yeah. the freedom that you, you learn from that is wonderful. And you can break oh, the rules as well. You know, mm. I mean, she comes very close to, I think, with the murder of Roger Ackroyd. She got quite criticised by some members of the community that it, was, it wasn't it was fair play detective fiction. Mm. But I think she skirted so close to, to breaking the rules that... I think that this is possibly one of the reasons why she she's so enduring that that it's so new and it's still very fresh with that. Um, but we spoke about earlier about setting, just touched on that, and so there's been a few questions in the chat about um, the settings for her books and if you could go to certain places with her, which one would you go to? Um, and obviously, Katie, yours is set in the traditional country house. Mm -hmm. And there's the, the whole, obviously, many of her books, Village Life, the usual cast of characters. Um, Katie, why did you choose an actual house, a country house? Was it influenced by Agatha Christie or? Yeah, I mean, when I wanted to write the, the book, when I first spoke to my agent about writing a murder mystery, I knew that if I was going to do it, I wanted to put everything I loved about these books into my own story. I wanted it to be a real classic golden age crime just set now. And a lot of that for me is the country house. It's the chandeliers and the cocktails and the terrace. Yeah. And it's the closed circle of suspects. And, you know, I couldn't snow them in, it's August, but I could have them stuck in this place and, you know, 
really get that feeling that you get when you snuggle down to watch a Poirot and you see them all come out in their cocktail dresses in the library. And yeah, I wanted that. That's what I wanted. <laughs> yes. Yes. How about you, Sophia? Because yours are very cocktail dressy as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think my, my settings kind of um, speak for themselves, given my main character. So yeah. I've got Windsor Castle, I've got Buckingham Palace, I've got Sandringham, um, and then I've got a world tour, practically, uh, in the one that I'm writing now. Um, and I mean, to an extent, well, actually, one of the things I like about Agatha's books are they, they're both up and down in society. So, you know, you, you get everything. You, you, you get the, the sort of snooty nose aristocrats and you get the Harris vicar and, and you get um, some of the sort of more working class characters. She doesn't necessarily draw as well, but they are there. Um, and, um, and I really like that. And I, again, in mine, even though it, it can be quite kind of queen heavy, I try, I try and make sure that I've got the range in there. Um, but yes, setting wise, um, the Queen has given me so much material to work with. Yeah. I don't really need to look very far. Uh, I think one of the questions in the chat was if you could go with Agatha to one of her settings, which would it be? For me, it would be Burr Island because I go there quite mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. Um, and as I think you mentioned earlier, that was it did inspire Evil Under the Sun. It also inspired and then there were none. Yeah. Um, but when you actually go there, you know, you can walk off the island when it's low tide. So I think that might throw <laughs> the plot slightly. There's also a sea tractor for two pounds you can get on. So I think that might have undermined the plot a little bit. But mine would have to be going to Burr Island with it. Is I there think, anyone you want to go with her? Haven't, haven't they um, done up the hotel at Burr Island recently? So it is more a art little bit, yeah, A little bit, yes. Um, because of obviously they were closed for quite a while so mm -hmm. they had an opportunity to do things such as the big glass dome has been redone and uh, but they've kept it very art deco and there's still the pilchard pub that's exceptionally old and, and has still all the old features and there's even agatha's writing hut there that she used to go and write in so you can Ooh, stay um, there if you um, want <laughs> i think i have to do that at some stage yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The women the mermaid like pool which inspired the pool in evil under the sun and there's you know not exactly pixie cove but there are lots of little coves around there so do you have a place you'd want to go to with agatha that was in one of her books is it Egypt, for, maybe? For me, it would be Egypt. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, more than one book. There's obviously there's um, Death on the Nile. There's also the one with the um, the horrible old lady. I mean, again, I've read it recently and I can't think what it's called, but there's a horrible old lady who is surrounded by her her family who are really suffering. Oh, appointment um, with death. Mrs. Exactly. Boynton. I've Ooh, got it. Actually. She's a um, spicy character. <laughs> yes, this one. Appointment with death. It's wonderful. That's um, a wonderful one. I, I mean, one of the things I love about um, about Agatha in Egypt, I, I was learning recently, you know, she, she'd had such a miserable time with her first husband and it had gone so horribly. Um, and then she got this muse house that I'm so fascinated by uh, in Cresswell Place. And she she built up, this was at the very beginning of, of muse houses becoming Shishi. She was one of the very first people to do that. And it's really funny because her story, uh, Murder in the Muse, co co constantly says, um, why didn't you ask one of the chauffeurs to come and help? And yeah, if you don't know I that were. muses were full of chauffeurs, that makes no sense at all, but they were at the time. Um, but anyway, so she built her writer's room up at the top and then she used to very kindly lend it out to friends if she wasn't there and they needed somewhere. So she lent it to this couple and they were so grateful that they took her with them to Egypt. And that's all, either she was with Egypt and that's where she met her second husband or that's they took right, her to yeah. a dinner party. They were the Willards, I think, were they yes. the Willards? And he's and Max Mallowan. And I just, I just love the idea that through her generosity with the house, that that's how she found her happy second marriage. So, um, and Egypt is sort of a real part of all of that. So that's where right. I go. I love, I love her in her autobiography. She talks about, and then I put aside my work and got on with the real work of doing my husband's book. The book she was most proud of in her entire life was her husband's book, <laughs> where she took the photographs for it. Uh, um, and all the the finds that they had, I thought that was absolutely wonderful. How about uh, you, Katie? Me... <laughs> Do you have somewhere you'd like to go with Agatha? I mean, again, so many places. I'd love to go to Iran. I'd love to go to Egypt. I mean, obviously, the Orient Express. But I think the place I'd like to go most uh, with her. So I went to her house Greenway last year, and um, 
I went with my husband and we looked around and I loved it so much. And I would love to explore that place with her because it's so yeah. full of all their collections and the things yeah. they gathered from mm -hmm. every trip they ever took. And I'd love to go through it with her and say, what's this? What's this? What did you keep this for? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And oh, I love it now. It. And what's so wonderful is obviously it's an enormously beautiful house, but it, there's no grandeur. It's, mm. it's 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 beautiful, but it's it's very homely. You know, here's it's the picture where place. she made the things she loved to eat. Here's her cookbooks and her little snuff box collection. As I, I've, we've got a great question in the chat actually from lovely Bonnie. Hi um, Bonnie. McBird, here's Bonnie. Do you all invent your locations or do you set them in exact places that you location scout? Now, I'm going to have to ask Sophia this one <laughs> because I really want to know, have you been in Buckingham Palace and how much of Buckingham Palace have you seen? I have been. I Thank goodness. When I was, um, I was editing book one, I was thinking about book two, but it was kind of it was early, early days. Instead of putting off going until later, I thought I'll go now and I'll do a tour of Buckingham Palace in the gardens. So I did. And then and then we had lockdown. And had I not gone then, I wouldn't have been able to go. And it, it played such a massive part in my researching of the book. Um, so yeah, I have been. So all the public rooms and the gardens um, are very much right. Um, and particularly the gardens, actually, the Queen takes a very important walk while she's working out the murder, which absolutely uh, follows the steps that I took when I when I did my tour. Um, and then the, the basement I have completely made up. There's very, very little information on it. So the kitchens, the boiler room I'd read about, which is like, a, you know, the boiler room of a steamship. I mean, it's, you know, it's massive. Yeah. Um, but the kitchens and the tunnels and all of those things I made up and obviously the Queen's private apartments. I knew a little bit. Um, so what I know I've put in, like the colour that she liked her bedroom to be in and that kind of thing. But um, I, I find it quite easy now that she sort of she steps through a fiction portal in my books um, from what we know to what we don't know. And, and then I just do what sounds authentic to me and hope for the best. And how about you, Katie? You... I make them all up because, <laughs> well... I think because of the stories I'm telling, I wouldn't want to um, start killing people off at a place that you know I've actually been to and existed in, in the same way that it isn't so much of a you know, part of the public consciousness like a castle. <laughs> yeah. um, but so Aldermere in the Three Dahlias is a, a, a National Trust type home, except it isn't because it's still owned by the family, but it's based on every National Trust property I've ever been to and the gardens and the grounds and, and all the rest of it. But I was able to take all the bits I liked best from all the different places and the bits that worked best for the story and put them together. Um, book two, A Very Lively Murder, which is out in the summer, that's set up uh, on a film set in Wales where they're at a house that's pretending to be <laughs> Aldermere in the first book. Um, and again, that's it's a very different house, but it's based oh, that's on so nice. lots of different ones that we do. And it's set... Um, also in the nearby village in North Wales. I grew up in North Wales. It isn't a real village, but it's about 20 minutes drive from where I lived. Wow. You know, so it's, it doesn't exist, but if it did, that's where it would be. <laughs> kind of a generic sort of, for instance, St Mary Mead. I drive up and down from London to Devon quite a lot. And um, it's a road that Agatha travelled quite a bit from London to Devon. And there is a place called St Mary's. Mm -hmm. And then as you go, 10 minutes further down the road there is another place called Mead <laughs> and you can see as you go along see how that oh works. Yeah. <laughs> this is what she saw and this is where <laughs> these things have come from and speaking of St Mary Mead we cannot have discussion of Agatha without a little bit about Miss Marple I think now you both have exceptionally strong female characters as sleuths in your book Miss Marple is of course one of the greatest um what do you think it is about Miss Marple that continues to attract readers, even though she very much comes from an entirely different generation with very different ideals. Um, so, for instance, in the first time she appears in The 13 Problems, she's very different to how she is in the later books. She is almost an old Victorian lady. She wears mm. all black. She wears a lot of lace, white hair. She sits bolt upright. She still massively appeals to audiences. There's always talk about a new reboot of Miss Marple coming. Why do you think somebody who is like that still appeals to audiences now? I'll start with Sophia. I think in a way she is all of us um, and, and probably in a similar way in that she is underestimated 
uh, but she's underneath, she's really clever. And, um, and she's got this incredible imagination going on. And I think perhaps we all feel that we're like that really, nobody understands me, <laughs> but I'm really good inside. Um, so I think there's an element of, of that. Um, and she really, she, she captures the sort of the little old ladiness of Miss Marple, doesn't she? But what, I mean, you know, there, there's the Marple book that's come out with the short stories and mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of people kind of trying to, to do Marple stories. And I think it, it's really important if you are trying to do that to capture the fact that she's not prudish and she's not fusty and she, she has quite a sort of a modern sensibility and she's, um, she's very moral, but, um, she she put her in, into any situation nowadays she'd be able to cope perfectly fine she would just apply her intelligence and get on with things um and so i think that makes her a very sort of flexible character that you can kind of put anywhere but but with it she brings the lovely specificity of saint mary mead and all her kind of her relations there it's it's really clever i think yeah. she'd have kind of every woman with this very specific village and hinterland behind her and how about you katie what do you think I, yes to all of that. Um, I also think it's her understanding of people because every solution she ever comes to, everything she ever felt works out, it's all based in people she's known before and how yeah. it links back to that one time with the butcher's son and things like yeah. that. She knows people and she knows everything about people. She knows the bad sides as well as the good. She can. She always expects to see the worst in people um, or she can always imagine what that worst might be and that's what leads her to figure out solutions and I think that is you know she she, say she isn't prudish she isn't sort of holding back she isn't you know needing the smelling salts or being astonished by anything she's expecting the worst um yeah and I think that, that that understanding of people and how awful people can be is why she feels quite timeless in that way <laughs> Yes, I think it, it does tie in actually now the way you're saying that to to a lot of American TV that's been really really popular. But you know it's it goes and it could be it could be horror or detective or that kind of thing. But you know it goes to a small town mm -hmm. where you think that everything is going to be um, um, either and actually Lee Child I suppose as well. You think everything is going to be kind of buttoned down um, and simplistic, but actually all human life is there. Yeah. yeah, and it works really well for TV, and it, yeah, it certainly works really well for her as well. Definitely. Definitely. I think I think we probably can't talk about Miss Marple without talking about the other chap, though, can we? We've got to talk about Poirot as well, um, and he's a very different kind of detective to Miss Marple. Often you think, "Gosh, how does he relate to other human beings?" Because he's so other, and I think she famously got quite irritated with him quite a lot. Um, obviously not knowing that the, the, the elderly gentleman who'd retired from the police force was still going to be going strong many decades later. I think someone worked out that he would have been 120 years old. <laughs> With his egg-shaped head, which With actually made no sense head. at all. <laughs> no. She used to get quite cross at him. Um, are you a fan of Poirot? Do you like Poirot as much as Miss Marple, as you say? I was always a Poirot girl. I always very much Poirot girl. And I think, you know, it's his otherness, it's his outsider status, it's coming as a bad director. That's what gives him the power to investigate. And, you know, that's why she made him all these things is because he would be able to get into these situations and be underestimated and these things. So, yeah, I was always a Poirot girl until <laughs> I started rereading the Miss Marples um, last year in order. I'm working my way through very slowly because I want to make them last. And I have... Again, I think this is an age thing. I have a completely new appreciation for Miss Marple and I've switched I switched sides. I've gone from Team Mustache to Team Cherry Brandy and I'm there. <laughs> I love her Cherry Brandy or the slow gin, you know. Let's just get the slow gin. They're always having a little tipple, aren't they, in the middle of the afternoon? <laughs> it helps the little grey cells. Perhaps. How about them. you, Sophia? Are you, are you a Poirot? I'm, well? I'm, team, I'm Team Cherry Brandy, but I do, I do love... Poirot. I, I love the fact that he's a refugee and I think that is really yeah. kind of important and it's so relevant to us now and the, the outsiderness that comes with that although that kind of disappears with time yeah. I guess the, yeah. the more successful he becomes but also I'm a massive Peter Ustinov fan and I, I can't kind <laughs> really? of you know, yeah, extract I was gonna mention that. that. I was going <laughs> to mention that earlier when you mentioned him because you know, I love it when you hear Death on the Nile and that music comes on mm. and you just think, oh, I'm just sinking into another world. But I, I would say, even though I think he did six 
We had six outings as Poirot. He's as far away from the Poirot in the books as you can possibly get, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> yes, but it still works. I don't care. It still works. I mean, it is fantastic how it works. But, you know, there's a lot of criticism of the recent one with, you know, for instance, John Malkovich taking it in a completely different direction for the ABC murders. Mm. Who would be your favourite? Yours is Peter Euston off, your favourite one who, who portrays it. Mine would have to be David Suchet. He does it beautifully. I mean, yeah. definitely. Mine is David Suchet, just because he's the one I grew up watching. Yeah. Doing it. And I, I just, he's who I see. And it, yeah. it wouldn't mm -hmm. matter if it wasn't in any way what was intended. He is who I see. He is the character for me. Yeah. I went to his recent stage show where he, he, <laughs> Did he you? told you how he inhabited the character because he's actually quite a different guy to Poirot, which is yeah, not want to be too And and the walk, he, he said he envisaged clenching a penny between his buttocks to do the walk. <laughs> That's exactly and, what it looks like. <laughs> and the voice, he said, you know, he's not about emotion in his chest and his heart. Mm -hmm. He's all about the head. So he was lifting the voice high because he's got a very deep voice, David Right. He's lifting yeah. it higher and higher until he became <laughs> <laughs> It was just, he walked wow. across the stage and just became... Hercule Poirot, it's the most magnificent thing. Um, yeah. We've had a question in the chat. If you were to switch places with one of her detectives, which one would you choose? Oh, that's a tricky one. I might go for Bundle Brent. I really like her, Frances Brent. She's in a couple of the books and she's a proper sort of flapper girl. Um, really I don't think fun. I know those ones. No. Okay, oh, that, that sounds fantastic. like I'd do that too. Yeah, um, she's really good. Yeah, I, I love the way P.G. Woodhouse creates that kind of character. So she's mm. similar to, to that than I would. Otherwise, Tuppence, I guess. Yeah. Somebody with, with long to live. <laughs> That's a good thing. I love how you meet Tuppence and they're, they're, they're really young. And then in the next one, they're old and married. <laughs> okay, we skipped some stuff there. <laughs> I think if I could count on her being immortal, which in my head she would have to be, uh, I would be Miss Marple because mm. she just she just gets to potter around, meddling with stuff, getting in the way, doing a spot of gardening, having some tea, pop and see the vicar, solve the murder. Yeah, yeah. I think it sounds great. <laughs> it is Perfect. a nice life. Yeah. yeah, and there's no indication as to how this is all financed or. <laughs> well, I imagine her nephew. I, uh, you know. Raymond were well, I, I imagine an, an inheritance. I mean, she comes from an age where people might have yeah. had, you know, a decent amount of money stacked away so i'm sort of imagining that yeah and all her holidays sort of you know when she's off to the caribbean that's raymond west going for god's sake just, just go somewhere else go and solve the murder stop <laughs> doing it here yes and then, then what do we find in the caribbean another murder <laughs> what <were> the odds? <laughs> um now we talked a little bit there about poirot being slightly irritating to agatha and she she particularly towards the end, was cross at him quite a bit. Do you have any characters you like who irritate you when you're writing them or you make purposefully quite irritating? I, I saw this question when you when you kindly shared it beforehand and I thought, do I? Oh, yes, I do. This is such a good it, question. It, and there's one it can't be, Sophia. There's one it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who? Oh, what, the Met queen? The main the one. <laughs> I have, uh, in, in the Windsor Knoll, I invented this character called um, Gavin Humphreys, who is the head of MI5. Um, and in the nature of these things, um, I'm sure the real head of MI5 is extremely sort of suave and intelligent and sophisticated. But my Gavin Humphreys is, is, is a bit of a technocrat and he's not very good with people and, and he's very full of himself. Um, and he doesn't get dogs, which is always a bad sign in my books. Um, and and he's very patronizing to the queen. So he tells her what she should think about President Putin and he tells her what she should think about her servants and how reliable they are. Uh, and he reminds her that one of her servants was a spy, which of course Anthony Blunt was, and all of which annoys her intensely. And I really enjoyed writing him. And then in the end, the way my books work is the queen has to make somebody else do the denouement because she's a secret mm. detective. And, and if I do it well enough, then the person who's doing the denouement to the Queen doesn't even know that they've been set up to do it. But the reader hopefully does know that um, the Queen did all the work. 
Um, and I, I really enjoy the fact that he's he's kind of her nemesis for a lot of the wins and all, but he he gets he gets all the credit at the end. And the, the sheer irritation of that I find very amusing. So yeah, I'm very That's fond good. of Gavin. I was very irritated by that, but in the best way. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Katie? Do you have anybody who? Oh yeah, think, I'm going to kill you off. I mean, that, that's the joy of it, is that I can write the irritating characters and then I can kill them off. And so that, you know, it's a nice sort of satisfying, satisfactory feeling when you think, oh, they've really annoyed me, but look, now they're horribly dead. <laughs> but Do you know, that's, that's an interesting you. thing. I mean, again, I come back to Agatha when I think about that, because I don't think I've killed anyone really irritating yet, or at least that's not why they die, because oh. that's just not the way these three plots no. have come to me. And, and it is one of those things is, you know, do, does the victim die because they're annoying or do they die for, for kind of some other reason? Um, and, and when I'm sort of trying to think through that and thinking, am I doing this right? You know, that, that's when I'll go back to some Agatha plots and think, and Dorothy L. Sayers as well. Yeah. But, you know, how does she do this? Do I have to make them irritating? I'm not sure. I think sometimes it's fun when they can be killed, not because they're irritating, but just because they happened to be collateral damage for the actual murder or there's something yeah. else. It's, just, it's still satisfactory. I still find it pleasing. But um, <laughs> yeah, not necessarily just because they just irritated the wrong person at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously somebody has to die in these books and many people die in, in Agatha's books. Um, and this is a cosy fest. So some people would say that's not particularly very cosy, I would suggest. So there is a darker side of Agatha Christie, I, I would say, um, particularly with some of her books where there's a supernatural influence. So, for instance, in The Pale Horse, she takes us down a route where we are actually starting to believe that perhaps some witches are cursing people or killing people, which we know can't possibly be the case. But but she has a great <laughs> talent for that. So, for instance, in the Sitterford mystery, has a Ouija board actually predicted the death of somebody? Well, we know it can't really have happened, but she's very good at making us think that perhaps it could have been a supernatural influence. Um, do you put ghosts or any sort of supernatural element in, or is there anything that you use that in your books couldn't possibly have happened, but you try to make them believe so. I, I, I haven't <laughs> done it yet, but given given the places that I write about, I can well imagine that in a future yeah. book, it mm. be set somewhere where that kind of thing happened. Um, and in fact, you know, book, book three is set at Sandringham and then I've made up some houses round and about in North Norfolk. And I did think about having a ghost in one of them, they which must was be very haunted. natural. They must be haunted. Must yeah, I would, I would very happily have done that. I just didn't have the word count to put one in. But, yeah, uh, I would be happy to. Do you do you enjoy her sort of darker ones, such as, for instance, Endless Night is very very dark. You're being basically, it, it is basically without giving too much away. Uh, how can I say this <laughs> without spoiling <laughs> it for people? There's a psychopath basically in that particular one. Do you enjoy her darker, more supernatural stories, Katie? I do. I, I think I do. I, I like the little cosy village crimes. I like the juxtaposition of everything being nice and there being tea and doilies and also someone being bludgeoned to death in the next room. And I like that, that comparison. But I like the darker supernatural ones as well because I just think it's a different aspect. I just think that she wrote so many books. She has to find new and interesting ways to yeah. tackle them, not just for the reader, but for herself to keep it interesting. Yeah. So there's yeah. new there's things often to a do. Bit. There's often a spooky bit. I mean, the, the mysterious Mr. Quinn is, yeah. is, is, is rather unusual. What is he? Who is he? Does he no really sense. exist? <laughs> I went through these again recently and I thought, yeah, he does exist because other people in the book are seeing him and talking to him, but he only appears when Mr. Satterthwaite sort of needs him. Yeah. He's almost like he's kind of Jiminy Cricket in a really dark way. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> bad. Really I enjoy it. it. Yeah. And I, I like I like a supernatural aspect. I, I um I enjoy that in books generally. So I do enjoy it when she employs it as well. And and I'll write one. <laughs> do, you, do you read many of her sort of darker ones? Not so much. I found the ABC murders was also kind of just slightly mm. sort of heading more in that direction, certainly suggesting that's the way it was going. 
And it, I agree with you, Katie, that it's great that she wrote such a wide variety of stuff. And I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, or, but personally, I tend to prefer it when there is a body in the library yeah. of the murder of the vicarage. And, and I like that kind of duality. But, um, but I think I also think, I mean, I, I was saying this yesterday, I think cosy is not well named. Um, okay. You can have cosy books where a cat helps a, a, a cake shop owner solve the disappearance of somebody's woolly hat maybe I don't really read those myself you know I, I tend to yeah. read so-called cozy mysteries where somebody is bludgeoned to death in the next room frankly um and the difference is that it is in the next room and we don't go into a lot of detail about it and you, you're not worried that it's going to happen to the detective particularly um but they are dark I mean you know they're, they're murder mysteries and murder is always horrible and I think one thing that um the, the classic ones have like Agatha's is there was the death penalty so mm -hmm. in yeah. the act of solving the crime you were also committing murder potentially and I think they were really aware of that particularly Dorothy Sayers was um so there is a darkness to them. yeah and I think also because she you know she came from a town and grew up alongside some of these magnificent Victorian ladies and there was quite a lot of spiritualism going on yeah. you know a little bit of Ouija board a little bit of tarot um and hosting a seance and they used to quite a, it was quite a morbid time I think as well mourning was a very big thing you know Miss Marple we meet her and she is in full black silk throughout um everybody giving their little stories as well so I think there is an inherent darkness in quite a lot of them yeah. But what, coming back to what you were saying about the death penalty, and I think um, a couple of her books towards the end, Sleeping, Murder and Curtain, um, she she included the possibility that there was a death penalty. But of course, mm -hmm. she'd written those during the Second World War because she wanted to be the one to end the series. Yeah. For both and locked them in a vault um, just in case she was killed during the Second World War. And then, of course, they came out in the 70s when there was no longer a death penalty <laughs> so there are a few i think somebody mentioned in the chat earlier that there are some anomalies with things and i think that's quite a big one that suddenly miss marple's a lot more sprightly in sleeping <laughs> <murder> <laughs> than she was yeah. at the end of the other ones um and we've talked quite a bit about the short stories do you you obviously enjoy reading those as well as the books um mm. Which ones would be your favourite ones coming to Sophia? Um, well, at the moment, it's Murder in the Muse because oh, that's I love what that I'm one. writing about. And it's one of those ones where one, once you've read it, reading it a second time, you're thinking, of course it's that. I know. Of course it's that. But so I didn't, clever. the first time I read it, I didn't get pick up on all no, of I the didn't. very obvious clues that she puts there. I didn't. It's so I so like clever. that one. That's so clever, that one. And Katie, do you have a favourite one? I don't think I do. I think I'm coming to the short stories quite late. I, I've never enjoyed short stories as a as a form. I never have. My husband loves them, so he reads loads of them. But recently, I've started reading them, and not exclusively because of this, but partly because they've brought out those really beautiful hardback copies of the Agatha Christie short stories, mm -hmm. and I love them so much. But if I'm going to buy them, I obviously have to read them. Um, so I've started reading them, and um, yeah, I find something really new in them they're a different challenge and i read them thinking about how i would write them because i'm yes. thinking about yeah. how i would write them yeah and um i love the idea of trying to fit an entire mystery into just such a short word count and i actually oh, wrote clever. a um dahlia lively short story uh for, to give away to my newsletter uh, subscribers at christmas and um i had so much fun doing it and i'm a bit afraid that it's actually my fit the my agent's favorite thing i've ever written <laughs> <laughs> The one I did for free, <laughs> that one. <laughs> but yeah, I, I so I've, I've turned around completely on short stories and I'm now a big fan, but I have to go and read them all. So I can't say I've got a favourite because I haven't read enough of them yet. Well, I would say that um, a lot of my favourites are in the 13 Problems because I think mm -hmm. what Agatha does so well with her short story collections is they're not just individual stories. There's an underlying narrative and the, the idea of this group of people just sitting together in a room saying I've heard about this mystery happening has anybody else had this sort of thing happen to them in their lives and they each go round and tell their story mm. in this sitting room you know presumably with the the the, the brandy going round or a bit of you know the slow gin and it, it it gives that 
that sort of that strange thing you often don't get in a short story collection a reason for them to be in a collection mm. together so you're you're anticipating the next story yeah whose is it going to be and what sort of tale will he tell what will the doctor's tale be what yeah. will the artist's <laughs> tale be and but each one there are hardly you know there are no duds in that collection mm. at all it, it's well, just it, fabulous it sort of goes back to chaucer and petrarch yes. i was just thinking <laughs> doing exactly that thing it's a great thing to do i was yeah, wondering the artist if my tale. english has put me off short stories and that's what the problem is and it's all because of chaucer but no no okay. it's okay <laughs> now in a lot of um Agatha Christie's works, um, she often leaves an ending that could be trickier for us to pull off these days, where the morality and justice of it is slightly difficult for the reader, perhaps. So, for instance, in um, Murder on the Orient Express, the killer or killers, trying not to give too much away for anybody, if there is anybody <laughs> left in the world who doesn't know what the ending of Murder on the Orient Express is, gets away with murder and there are a few where e they either get away with it or they are given the uh, dignified out instead of being being hanged in that particular instance um so for instance perilla and house we don't see the 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 killer getting their comeuppance they are given a way out do you think you could get away with that in today's literature could could the killer walk away the person in charge of um, some of the murders in one of my books ultimately does get away with it, yeah. really. Um, yeah, because that's just how things are. I mean, I, I find some people get their comeuppance and, and some people don't. Um, and I hope I've, the reader still gets a sense of satisfaction out of it. They know what happened. Um, but that's kind of the way of it. But I think, I think without the death penalty, the death penalty just makes all the difference, yeah. I think. Uh, in terms of whether you, how how you approach that, you know, wh whether that person, whether their alternative is is death or not. Yes. Yeah. So, how about you, Katie? Would you let death on the Nile have its ending <laughs> in that way? Would you give them an out? <laughs> let them. Yeah, I think I quite like it. I like the idea that justice is justice, and it isn't for us to necessarily say. So, I like the idea that sometimes. It has to go through the courts and it has to go and do that and that you know traditionally that is what will happen but i like that there are some cases where actually that's not the right thing i think it depends how the story pans out the story you're telling and who the people are the motives i think make a lot of difference as well i think you know i'm not saying there is a good enough motive for killing absolutely no but I do think that the characters and the people, I like that it's not just automatic, it's not formulaic, there is thought behind it, There is, the, you can see the detective figuring out the right answer for this, and there's no good answer, somebody's dead, everything is awful, yeah. there is, you can't bring them back to life. But I like that it isn't just an automatic, and we'll send them off to be hanged. Yeah. I like that there is real thought and real people, I think it makes it feel more human. Exactly. Well... I've just looked at the clock and I'm astonished. <laughs> <We have laughs> one minute left, ladies. So thank you so much, Sophia Bennett and Katie Watson, for what has been a very quick hour and absolutely wonderful. I could sit and chat all day about this, basically. Uh, but we have more people coming up. I believe the wonderful Janice Hallett is on next. So we must clear the screens and say goodbye to everybody. I'm hoping that Sam is going to come on in a moment and tell us what we need to do. Sam, are you out there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you for having us. It's been really lovely. Here is you Sam. weren't supposed to make me come on camera. <laughs> in my very sexy set. We had a deal. Thank you all so much. You have been incredible. What a great hour I've had just sat here. It's been a lot of fun. Thank it's you for having thrilled. us. Really fun. Um, everyone, hold up your latest book or your debut crime fiction. Mine's over there in the corner next to Agatha. <laughs> oh, yours is on my okay. phone, Victoria. I can't even help you out. <laughs> Thank you all. I have dropped the links to your websites in the um, in the chat. So Thank everyone you. go and have a good look. Thank you all so much. You have all been fantastic. Thank it's you. It's been a lot of fun. It's been Thank wonderful. So, much. It was so interesting. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you.